It's my pleasure as CCN Vice Chair to introduce Andrew Gwynn MP, who is the Shadow Secretary of State uh, for Communities and Local Governments. Uh, Andrew, as many of you will know, is a former councillor in Tameside in Greater Manchester. Uh, while clearly not a county, nonetheless, Andrew and his front bench team, I think all of his front bench team, have substantial uh, local government experience with a very clear understanding of the importance of resources, of delivery for our communities at a local level uh, and the key role of national government in enabling that. We're delighted that Andrew has managed to make it to CCN this afternoon with all the transport challenges that there are out there today uh, and very much look forward to his comments after which uh, Andrew will be very happy to answer questions. So welcome Andrew. Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me here to speak today, and I want to uh, begin by uh, congratulating the County Council's network for the work that you do in championing the voices of England's county authorities on the national stage. And I want to also thank the many thousands of councillors and council officers and staff who demonstrate the commitment that you have to your communities through all of your work, day in, day out. As Simon mentioned, I'm a former councillor myself. My wife uh, is the cabinet member for neighbourhood services in Tameside Council, and so we still have a very strong connection with local government. And uh, I know, if I'm being brutally honest with you, having spent 12 years as a councillor, and 13 years now as a Member of Parliament on both the government and the opposition benches, I actually know where I was able to make a very real difference. And it wasn't in Westminster or Whitehall, it was actually in the Town Hall. I also want to thank you, Simon, for uh, introducing me, but also for continuing to be a strong Labour voice for the sector. Uh, after last year's county council elections, we have fewer strong Labour voices than perhaps I would like, but uh, to those of you that are uh, Labour county councillors, I want to uh, pay a particular uh, thanks for uh, the work that you do to keep the flag flying in the county sector. But I also want to pay tribute to Councillor Ian Stewart, who sadly passed away last month. Ian played such an important role as CCN spokesman for communities and well-being, and was a key voice in the national push for sustainable funding for county authorities. And I know that he is greatly missed across the network and across the sector. Now, it is a privilege to be here today, and this conference comes at a key time as we lead up to the local government finance settlement. Because if we're to take the government's word at face value, the age of austerity is over. Now, it was only a few weeks ago, a world away from the Brexit crisis uh, currently engulfing Westminster, that the Prime Minister was dancing across a stage in Birmingham uh, to give us the good news. And I expect that many of you in this room welcomed uh, the news of the end to austerity with a sigh of relief, because no longer would you worry about balancing the books. No longer would you worry about how you're going to provide care for vulnerable children. No longer would you worry that the elderly people in your communities wouldn't be able to get the care that they need. And then the budget came, and instead of proper funding for services, we were given another set of sticking plasters. Now, one of the most important duties of any government, I think, is to ensure that the most vulnerable in society are protected. But with an overspending on children's services hitting a new high of £800 million a year, the Chancellor's pledge of £84 million for 20 councils comes nowhere close to addressing the crisis that you are all facing and other uh, top-tier authorities are facing. And that is just children's services. Just as the £1.3 billion uh, cut to budgets, still to come next year, uh, the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services predict that councils will need two and 
a bit billion pounds next year just to stand still. Now, £650 million may prop up this broken social care system for now, but behind these figures are real people that need real support and help. They need long-term solutions uh, to the crisis facing social care. So now we all hold out a degree of hope for the local government finance settlement at the start of December. The government has one last opportunity to show that it is listening to the sector and it has to show genuinely that austerity really is over. It has to be more than just a catchphrase because local government should be at the front of the queue if there is going to be an uplift in public spending. And this means funding that represents the true cost of delivering services and the strategies to deal with the crises in children's services and adult social care. Because councils were the first and perhaps the easiest target when the coalition government came to power. And over those years, you've lost 60 pence out of every pound that you were spending uh, in 2010. And whilst the government has been cutting funding to councils, Ministers have continually attempted to shift the blame onto you. And I say that irrespective of which party allegiance you have or whether you have a party allegiance. They've hung out councillors of all political persuasions and none out to dry, shifting the blame onto each and every one of you. And they should have been fighting your corner because you deliver the crunch services that keep our communities ticking. But instead, they pass the book. And whilst Whitehall gets itself into a frenzy over Brexit, important though that issue is, it's in county halls and town halls across the country that real problems are hitting home. Years of uncertainty and unfair funding has created... Well, what began as a quiet crisis, I'm not sure it's quite so quiet anymore when it even hits the six o'clock news on the BBC. And it's councillors like yourselves that are expected to pick up the pieces. Now, long-serving councillor David Hodge was pushed to resignation last week over the crisis after serving Surrey County Council <laughs> since 2011. Earlier this year, he warned... The government cannot stand idly by when Rome burns. We have a £39 million budget gap. Now, I respect those views because those are the views of council leaders in every town and county hall around this country. They are real pressures that are putting real problems on the front line of delivering the services our constituents need and expect to see. And these are challenging times, and I pay tribute to council leaders and councillors of all political persuasions for the work that you have done over the past few years to make your services leaner and fit for purpose. But that cliff edge is still approaching for so many local authorities, and again I say it, of all political persuasions and none. And unless we can properly fund local government and the services our communities rely on going forwards, not with sticking plasters, but with real long-term solutions to the problems facing your communities and mine, then local government, I fear, will not have a future. And I say that as somebody that believes in local government, understands local government, and wants to support local government. Because good local government provides strong communities, decent public services, and helps our communities to grow and prosper. Now, the funding pressures that have hit the sector have made councils adapt 
And that's no bad thing. You know, I can remember my first days as a Tameside councillor at the age of 21, which back in 1996 was the youngest you could be, and asking pretty senior councillors that have been around since year dot, why do we do it like this? Out of the mouth of babes. And they'd say, Andrew, just sit and learn and listen, because we've always done it like this. And actually, you know, not everything over the past eight years has been bad. And one of the good things has been the freedom for councils to innovate and to be able to deliver public services in a modern, more joined up, forward thinking way, because we can no longer deliver it the way we've always delivered it. And we have, you have been forced into adapting to those needs. But we must make sure that innovation is not stifled in the future. And that does mean a commitment to local government. Because innovation is good as long as the resources are there to be able to innovate. And many councils are now reaching breaking point. Short-term sticking plasters will not keep the wolves at the door for much longer. The whole of local government is struggling to cope with rapidly decreasing funding and increasing demands. And it is worth remembering that in many areas, many areas have already lost most, if not all, of their revenue support grant. But by 2020, much of local government will have seen close to 75% reductions in the grant funding that it received, even as recently as 2015. And so it's of little surprise that the uh, recent surveys in the local government sector show that both managers, chief executives and councillors say that they don't feel able to make some of the necessary savings demanded by government in future years. And there are a number of local authorities that are getting very close to uh, having to issue Section 114 notices at some point over the coming few years. Half of council heads are seriously worried of impending bankruptcy. So we need to look at long-term funding decisions that will help the sector. Now, I want to be very clear that if I'm ever in the position of being the Secretary of State for communities and local government, I will not be one that will seek to shift the blame onto our hard-working councillors, because ultimately the need to resource local government fairly across the country needs a central government that is committed to ensuring that happens, and we need action that will work. So that's why I am calling on this government and our Secretary of State to hopefully when the settlement is announced, cancel the planned cuts that are hardwired into uh, our budgets for the future years of £1.3 billion. Because if austerity is truly over, local government needs that help. And with the LGA predicting that councils will be facing a £3.9 billion funding black hole next year, this is the very least that should be done uh, in December. Beyond this year, the current situation is not sustainable. We need a proper strategic approach on how we fund local government and the services that you all deliver, not just uh, one-off cash payouts, but some degree of certainty as to what your budgets need to look like in the years ahead. The sector does need additional funding. And look, I'll be honest with you, Politics is always a question of priorities. You don't need me as a national politician to tell you as local politicians when you are making these tough choices and prioritising decisions day in, day out. But we need to practise what we preach from the centre as well. And if we can find money for pet projects or pet tax cuts, 
we can also find the money for our public services. And I make this pledge to you, around the cabinet table of the next Labour government, I will champion the needs of local government to have the resources you need to be able to deliver that vision that wherever we come from on the political spectrum, that we all share. We want to live in a fairer, more equal, more prosperous country. We want our communities to be strong and we want to be able to support those who are most vulnerable. And I've done a little bit of work, well actually my research has done a little bit of work and looking at the Labour Party's manifesto from the last general election. Were we to have to implement that manifesto, 44% of the manifesto commitments will land on town and county halls desks to deliver it. Now that is a big ask of each and every one of you in this room. But I know, talking to people across the sector in all levels of local government and from all political backgrounds, the desire that each and every one of you have to be able to do what's best by your communities. And if you have a government that gives you the resources, that sets out, in terms of national policy, the what needs to be delivered, you have the ability, the capability, the ideas and the ambition to deliver the how. Because what works in Derbyshire won't work in Durham. What works in Surrey won't work in Somerset. You have the ideas, you have the ambition. And I want to give you the freedom and the responsibility to deliver the best that your communities need. And that's why we need long-term planning. Because so much of what we will ask of each and every one of you requires capacity building back into local government. Whether it's building the new homes or even managing the new homes, many local authorities do not have the capacity to deliver that right now. Whether it's reinvesting in early years and sure start, many local authorities don't have the capacity from day one to deliver uh, those services the way they once did. Or whether it's something as simple as recreating a municipal bus company to run bus services in your area. Of course, it's 40 years ago since many local authorities physically ran bus services before bus deregulation, and so capacity is probably the biggest challenge uh, for uh, the Labour uh, vision for local government going forwards. Now, I want to end by giving you some hope that whatever happens in the weeks, the months and the years ahead, in the Labour communities and local government team, you will have a champion for this sector. We understand local government because we were all brought through politics via local government. We understand the importance of local government, the difference that county councils, district councils and Mets and London boroughs and unitaries can make to the communities we serve. The day-to-day -day challenges that affect the communities we proudly represent the real difference that councillors, given the freedom, given the responsibility and given the resources, can make to transform and improve people's lives from cradle to grave. Local government is there for each and every one of us as a citizen of this country. Let's empower local government. Let's empower you as councillors. And let's create that better, fairer, more equal country, strong communities where everybody has a stake, everybody has a future, and everybody can prosper and grow old with dignity. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for inviting me here today. And let's speak up for local government because local government does great things all the time and we should never be ashamed or shy 
of reminding people of the difference that our councils and our councillors make. So thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Andrew. Um, hopefully we still have a microphone around somewhere. We do indeed. Uh, that's better. I can uh, see you. Uh, a number of hands have shot up. <laughs> da da David's yeah. going to have the first right of reply. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll, mo we'll move forward from there. Chairman. Is this on? Yeah. Chairman, it's unfortunate that the Labour speaker hasn't got a clue who David Hodge is. If he knew the David Hodge like I do, and like most people in the Conservative Party knows David Hodge, you know one thing, he doesn't get pushed. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll have Anne, who was uh, sat in roughly the same area, and then we'll move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anne Weston from Derbyshire. Um, we spent a lot of time today thinking about uh, the problems that we've got with adult social care. And in a lot of areas, that problem is compounded by the relationships with the health service locally and the structures that we have to work with and the opaque nature of those structures. Uh, been cut off. We all know, we all know that if we could, if we could manage that health and social care pound collectively better, we could go a long way to providing better services for people. Now you're a Tameside MP and in Greater Manchester they've got de devolved powers around this. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in the future around health and social care relationships and whether there are lessons we can learn from Greater Manchester or at least get the freedoms more widespread so that we can yeah. you know, manage our own future better. Thank you. I think, should we just take another couple, uh, yep. Andrew, and then bring you back? Yep. Um, Martin, should we come forward? Martin, do you have your hand up? And then I'll go back. Thank you. And stolen my question about adult social care, actually. But uh, I didn't, maybe I can just rephrase the same question slightly. You spoke a lot about the, the pressures on local government. What I didn't hear was what Labour's solution long term is to the adult social care, and I'd add in children's services pressures. It's always very easy to mm. criticize other parties, and everyone yep. does it, yeah? But what I wasn't hearing was, what's your solution? Is it just more tax, more spending, or what? You know, so if you could just clarify that, maybe in partnership with Anne's question, that yep. would be really useful for us. And if I can just link one other question to it, which is, what's your policy on the cap on council tax increases? Would you remove that entirely, change it, give us that power locally, or retain it? Thank you. And then I think there's one, Cornelius, towards the back. Yeah, Thank you. Um, a, a Cornwall Council, of which I'm a member, will be having a scrutiny inquiry into the private rented sector in Cornwall in the new year. Uh, I'd, so I'd like some clarification about what your position is about the possibility of long-term tenancies for people in, in the private rented sector, and also about rent control. Uh, these are the questions I would have asked James Brokenshire if he'd had time to stay but I'd be interested in your opinion as well. So private rented sector, long-term tenancies and some sort of rent control regulation. Thank you. I think I'll ask Andrew to come back Yeah, uh, and then um, we'll come over to the other side. Okay, in reverse order. So Cornelius, in terms of the private rented sector, I think there's a number of things. Firstly, we need to have stronger licensing regimes in place. I know there are some parts of the country uh, that have license uh, regimes, uh, but um, we need to make sure that that's consistent across the country, particularly uh, in areas where private rented sector has ballooned in recent years. You know, one of the things that really frustrates me and... Um, Governments of all political persuasions just haven't really taken seriously the housing crisis in terms of um, council homes um, and the public sector housing for a long period of time. And actually, I do give some very real credit to Gary Porter, who I see sitting at the front, because uh, you know he's been really championing. Uh, the need for councils to be given the freedoms, the flexibilities and the powers to be able to uh, build homes again. And, uh, you know, we, we got some welcome announcements from the government recently. And I'm glad that 
all political parties are actually talking about council homes because they do have a real role to play in the mix. But on private rented accommodation, I remember very early on as a, uh, as a newly elected MP, and I was called out to uh, a house which had been a council house. It was one of those 1940s semi-detached houses that you see in every community um, in, in the country and uh, one side of the semi-detached was still in the public sector and had gone through the decent home standard so um, new roof, new doors, new bathroom, new windows, um, you know all mod cons it, and it was fit for habitation. Uh, but the gentleman I was visiting lived sadly next door and it had a, a leaky old roof that needed replacing. It had the metal window frames, which were original, uh, lots of damp and uh, it was really cold and the window frames were rusty and rattly. Um, a 1960s kitchen, the house hadn't been modernised. It wasn't fit for habitation. The rent which incidentally we were paying through um, housing benefit, the rent was £20 a week more than the decent home next door. Now, that cannot be right in any decent modern society. So I actually think that the decent home standards should also apply uh, to the private rented sector and not just to the public sector uh, housing. In terms of tenants' rights and um, strengthening those, Absolutely, we've got to. Um, we, you know, so much of my casework now is where people have been forced against their what would be their choice uh, into private rented accommodation because there just is no public sector stock available for them. And if they complain about something even fairly minor, they're given their notice to quit. And particularly when they're bringing up young children in that kind of situation. It's not great being moved from home to home every six months or so. Uh, and rent controls, absolutely, that's Labour Party policy, particularly in those really high rent areas of the country. If we believe in mixed communities, then we have to make sure that those young people in particular that have grown up in a particular community want to bring their own family up in their home community are able to do so. So those are things that very much uh, we would be on side with. Uh, in terms of Anne and Martin on uh, social care, um, I actually think local government has got a really important role to play in, um, in properly integrating health and social care. Um, and Greater Manchester does have a degree of devolution, and Anne, you will know that that extends into parts of Derbyshire because my own clinical commissioning group, Tameside and Glossop, the Anne Glossop is the elephant in the room because it crosses over the county boundary into Derbyshire. Um, the CCG there was about to go belly up and one of the Manchester CCGs were very keen on, on taking over Tameside and Glossop Clinical Commissioning Group and uh, the reaction of horror from Tameside Council because um, as well as having a really small CCG, we have a very small district general hospital that has gone on a huge transformation in recent years. It was one of the Keogh Trust hospitals that was in special measures. It's now been taken out of special measures. It's on a, a journey of very real and noticeable improvement. And they were doing a lot of collaborative work, both with Tameside Council and Tameside and Glossop CCG, and also with Derbyshire County Council to make sure that you got proper joined up uh, services. And so the chief executive of Tameside Council was adamant he didn't want some kind of power struggle with a Manchester CCG that would have asset stripped all the health resources out of Tameside. And so they went to, um, to the health secretary um, and said, look, I know this sits outside of the Health and Social Care Act 2012. Uh, it goes against all the kind of um, uh, uh, any qualified provider section 75 rules, um, but we believe we can create a proper joined up integrated health economy um, not just an integrated service, but uh, uh, properly joining up the CCG, the council and the hospital trust. And they said, go away, make it happen, we'll pretend we haven't seen it, um, just make it work. And they have, and uh, I know it's been repeated in councils 
elsewhere, but our chief executive is now the chief executive of the CCG. There is proper accountability because it means that the, uh, the Health Scrutiny Committee of Tameside Council, when they give the curly finger to the chief executive of the council, they've also got the chief executive of the CCG there. And the council's finance director is the finance director of the CCG. And you get in proper, really smart, joined up uh, decision making. Now, actually, it's not that radical. Because all of you in this room that will know your local government history knows that local government was born out of improving public health. Uh, many uh, district councils uh, were created out of local boards of health in the 1880s and, and, and the 1870s. And at each stage of local government reorganisation, right the way through to 1974 and, and beyond, local authorities have lost a bit more of their uh, health role. I actually think there is a massive health role for local government and we should be properly integrating. Again, uh, government, central government, of whatever political complexion, can set out the what so that the N in NHS is still important, whether you live here in Guildford or you live in Greater Manchester, you would expect the same minimum entitlements but how you deliver that service is going to be very radically different because you've got different needs and the local authority can then start to innovate. So I actually think, Anne, in a, in a long-winded answer to your question, uh, there is exciting prospects for local government to take on much, much more health responsibility and getting some proper joined-up um, joined thinking uh, Martin, in terms of uh, funding, well, of course, at the last general election, we set out uh, an £8 billion uplift for adult social care, but I, ac I accept that is not the sole answer to the problem. Uh, yes, money is part of it, but actually uh, we have to have a more fundamental review of how we finance local services going forwards. I wish I had an answer. What I can give you is a commitment that the Labour Party is undertaking a fundamental review as to how we fund local government going forwards. So the conversation, and Jim McMahon is going to launch a green paper, the conversation we will be having with the local government family uh, will um, include what services do we want modern local government to be providing, and then from that, how do we fund it in a way uh, that is fair, that is sustainable? Uh, there probably has to be some form of redistributive mechanism in place. To give you an example, my own uh, local authority where I live, Tameside, I have a cross-borough constituency, Tameside and Stockport, but my own uh, council, Tameside, this year has a £16 million adult social care funding gap. Now, integration is part of the answer, um, but a 1% increase on the council tax in Tameside brings in £750,000. So for the Tamesides of this world, the social care levy is a sticking plaster. It will generate a bit more income, but nothing like uh, co compared to the need that, that we have. Uh, Neighbouring Stockport, actually a 1% 1, 1 uh, increase in council tax brings in uh, over double what it brings in in Tameside. So we, you know, not every council has the same council tax base. So from that green paper, we will be conducting a review as to whether council tax itself is fit for purpose, whether it can be amended with additional council tax bans at either end of the scale, or whether we need a new system altogether. We will look at international comparisons. And genuinely, if anybody in this room has any ideas about what may work, please feed into that review. It doesn't matter what your complexion of your local authority is, we genuinely want to get any future funding review for local government uh, in place to be workable, to be workable for the long term, uh, and that means looking afresh at council tax, at business rates, or whether we need uh, something completely different. And I would be interested in your view on the cap as well, that if we keep uh, council tax, do we genuinely give local authorities 
uh, full fiscal freedom and allow the electorates to decide whether or not that is too much spending or too little spending, because after all, that's why each and every one of you in this room stands for election every four years. Um, and then, David, I didn't mean to be uh, disparaging, but just genuinely, local government is in crisis. And, you know, I pay tribute to council leaders across the country for the work that you do. But local government can't continue like this. Whether you're a county council, whether you're a unitary council, whether you're a Met borough or a London borough or a district, local government is in crisis. And genuinely, if we can't work across uh, party complexions to find a financial solution as to how we pay for a sustainable uh, local government sector going forwards, I, I, I give up. Uh, I genuinely believe that we all come into politics for the same reason, and that is to improve our local communities and the people who live in our local communities. And if you have one hand or sometimes even two hands tied behind your backs by central government, then central government isn't doing its job. Uh, local government is in financial crisis. Uh, it's my job, I hope, as the Shadow Secretary of State to call that out and to hopefully get the current government and the current Secretary of State to change his mind. Um, but that's also why we're doing the long-term piece of work, so that when that pendulum eventually does swing, and who knows, it might be sooner rather than later, I don't know. I changed my mind on a, a, an hourly basis at the moment. Um, we have to be ready to put our money where our mouths are. If we believe in good quality local services and fully funding local government, then it's my job to, um, to make sure that you are as well resourced as local county authorities in this case, but the same is true of every other local authority, so that you can do your jobs, because actually, given those freedoms, you do a really good job. Uh, and that's why I started and I ended with saying thank you because we don't say thank you enough to those who serve our public, serve our communities in difficult times and in good times. I was privileged enough to be a councillor for, uh, for 12 years and we had 12 years of budget growth over those years. Um, I want the next generation of councillors to have a similar opportunity. Uh, thank you. I did see two hands on the other side, so I'll ask uh, those two, and then Andrew will go in, and then we'll finish. So it's Nick Rushton and then Richard Chataway. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Uh, Andrew, I'm the leader of Leicester County Council. In the middle, we have a large unitary council, the City Council. What, what is Labour's policy for the review of local government uh, full stop? I happen to suffer a two-tier area, yeah. and I was hoping that uh, you might have some good news for me. <laughs> thank you. And then Richard. Dave, thanks for your speech today. I've been coming to this conference now for about four years. And the same message has been coming out from this conference, has been coming out from the LGA conference, about the underfunding of local government. And I'm not quite sure that government understands what that actually means, not to us as councillors, but to the people on the streets who are receiving those services. Adult services has been mentioned in crisis. The people who are expecting to deliver the majority of those services are on minimum wage. School's going to get the little extras because of the budget, like teachers and books. I'm just wondering, as Secretary of State, which could be very soon with what's happening in Westminster, what, how do we start to sort out those priorities, and would you rather be Brexit Secretary? <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't wish Brexit Secretary on me. Uh, Richard, in, in, in terms of... You know, we, we focus rightly on adults and children's services because, A, they are the big spending areas, um, but also they are where the huge pressures are, are piling up. But the real frustration and where there is a danger of a disconnect with the voting public is that people are now starting to see all the things that they think they pay their council tax for. So Mrs Smith thinks if you knock on her door, she pays her council tax for the street lights, for the roads to be repaired, for the parks uh, and grass verges to be well maintained, um, for the libraries to be open uh, and the bins to be emptied and so on and so on. 
It's those services that are getting squeezed relentlessly to pay for the invisible services of adults and children. So it does, in the end, come down to uh, funding those pressures so that local authorities are able to maintain the services that Mr and Mrs Smith thinks that they pay their council tax for. Um, and, you know, that feeds into the green paper that Jim McMahon uh, will be launching very soon. And the discussion we've got to have, not only about, and this comes on to Nick's point, uh, about two-tier areas, not just about whether or not um, councils are providing all the services we would wish councils to provide, um, but also at which level and whether we need a two-tier system or not as well. Now, my first priority is getting funding in place for local government rather than a distraction of uh, massive reorganisation of local government. But I know, speaking to uh, various different local government bodies, local government reorganisation always comes up as a subject. I mean, obviously, when I'm at the county councils network, they say it's the county authorities that should be retained. When I'm at the district councils um, bodies, they say, well, districts um, provide the best level of services and so on. But I think that there is a conversation that we need to have about how we uh, do provide local government and what structure local government should be going forwards because it is uh, largely 44 years since we had a massive wholesale uh, reorganisation of local government and uh, what worked for 1974 perhaps uh, is under stress and strain all these decades later but funding is the fundamental issue that we need to resolve uh, in the uh, immediate period because we can talk about what structure of local government we need until we're blue in the face, but if we don't fund our public services, there'll be no local government at county or district level to pick up the pieces if we're not careful. Andrew, thank you very much uh, for coming along this afternoon. Thank you for engaging uh, so deeply with all the issues that are some very important issues that, that we're all dealing with in our individual councils at the moment uh, and uh, for answering all the questions uh, that have been put. Uh, if we can just give Andrew uh, uh, another show of appreciation, please. Thank you very much.